Welcome, I'm Peter Frank, Provost at Grove City College, and I'm excited to introduce to you the next installment of The Life of the Mind, Great Lectures from the Grove. This series is entitled Reading the Times, presented by Dr. Jeffrey Bilbro. Dr. Bilbro is an Associate Professor of English here at Grove City College, and he's a nationally known author and expert on the work of Wendell Berry, and he also serves as editor of the Front Porch Republic. He received his BA from George Fox University and his PhD in literature from Baylor University. This course is based on his award-winning book, Reading the Times, a literary and theological inquiry into the news. I hope you enjoy this next course in our series, The Life of the Mind, Great Lectures from the Grove. When people find out I've written a book about the news, they often ask me one of any number of questions about particular problems with the news media or the way that we consume it. What do I think about fake news? What do I think about social media? Where should we get our news from? What outlets can I trust? How do I navigate our partisan media landscape? Is it Fox News or MSNBC or the New York Times or fill in the blank, the real source of all the problems with the news? These are all fair questions, but given the extent of the underlying challenges that are beneath them, I don't think they can be answered easily or in isolation. In other words, if you're hoping for a TED Talk style set of lectures that provide easily digestible answers to all your questions about the news, my book and this video series are probably going to disappoint you. The reality is more complicated and messy. But rather than laying out a series of easy answers, I'm going to try to explore a set of questions to live with as we seek to navigate our media landscape wisely and redemptively. What I'm going to try to do is offer the outlines of a practical theology of the news. Along the way, you'll hear from some of the wise people who have helped me. One of my favorite parts about being a college teacher is having the opportunity to introduce others to the guides who have encouraged and shaped me. So thank you for joining me on this journey to better understand what the news is, what its purpose ought to be, and how we can wisely attend to the events of our world. In early 2017, less than a month after Donald Trump was inaugurated as the President of the United States, the Washington Post adopted a new slogan, Democracy Dies in Darkness. There is, of course, a long tradition that sees a free and independent press as essential to a healthy democracy and the common good. In our post-fact culture, moreover, payons to the importance of the press have grown increasingly emphatic. And for good reason, the media can host a thoughtful, informed conversation around the issues of our day, and such a conversation does indeed serve the common good. Yet, when we're inundated with stories and issues that demand our attention, it seems rather naive to think that democracy will be preserved if we simply have more news, more fact-checking, more investigative reporting, and more deep dives. We don't just need the media to cast a more piercing light. Rather, as consumers of the nude, we also need to reevaluate the light that we rely upon to understand our times and discern how to respond. In his prologue to, the go to his gospel, John directs our attention to a different light, the Word who is the light that shines in the darkness. And John reassures us that the darkness has not overcome it. John urges us to place our faith not in the light shed by the news of the moment, but in the light of the good news that speaks time itself into existence. The primary light we need to participate in democracy, to serve the common good, and to dwell as faithful citizens of the city of God isn't shed by the Washington Post, but by the light of the world. How might we begin living by this light now, in the midst of a world where darkness often seems to prevail? For centuries, Christians, particularly in the Protestant tradition, saw printing technologies and the freedom of the press as handmaidens to the light of the gospel. Yet matters seem more fraught in our current digital media ecosystem. The Catholic philosopher Yvonne Illich's understanding of technological change may illuminate this historical trajectory. 
Illich claims that when industrial technologies replace traditional tools, there's an initial inflection point at which industrialization introduces significant improvements. However, at some later point, the industrialized tools begin causing new problems and the marginal utility of further professionalization, industrialization, begins to decline. It's after the second watershed is passed that the application of industrial technologies tends to cause more harm than good. In the context of medicine, Illich locates the first watershed around 1913 as germ theory and new medicines led to marked improvement in people's health. But by the 1950s, iatrogenic diseases were induced by the medical system. These were on the rise, and the cost of healing became dwarfed by the cost of extending sick life. Illich traces a similar trajectory in many spheres of life, including education, mail, social work, transportation, and civil engineering. If, in the context of media technologies, Gutenberg's press represented the first watershed, the second watershed may have been the application of steam power to printing. Digital media have recapitulated this cycle. If the first watershed of digital texts was crossed at some point in the early 1990s, the second one may be marked by the 2007 release of the iPhone. As smartphones became ubiquitous, a few companies, Facebook, Google, and Amazon in particular, consolidated and monetized the more decentralized flow of information that marked the early days of the internet. In this digitized media ecosystem, the light of the news media may distract from the light of the gospel as often as it serves it. While the Washington Post claims that democracy dies in darkness, democracy can also die in hypermedia's garish light. The celebrity gossip, ephemeral political drama, and quirky distractions that dominate our media don't always serve the common good. Keeping up to date with the latest funny video or outrageous statement that pulses through our social, social media feeds doesn't bolster democracy. The top story on BuzzFeed News recently exemplifies this genre. This woman pretended to be a bush during her sister's engagement, and it's pretty funny. And this is a relatively innocuous example. Media critics like Daniel Borstein, Neil Postman, and John Somerville have argued that the news media creates these pseudo-events that make up so much of the drama that fills television broadcasts and newspaper pages. Many of the events that compose the news emerging from Washington, D.C., or New York City, or Hollywood, are Baudrillian simulacra, representations designed to amuse and distract, but whose relation to reality is tangential at best. And even when serious events are happening, when a pandemic is sweeping the world, or police are killing African Americans, or war is unfolding in horrific fashion, they can be trivialized through memes and hashtags and co-opted by simplistic partisan narratives. Indeed, one reason why it's so difficult now to discern how to follow the news is that our media has become incredibly diverse. It includes TV and radio broadcasts, as well as 30-second video clips and podcasts, newspapers and magazines, as well as blogs, long-form journalism, as well as tweets and Facebook posts. And all these forms are interdependent. Serious essays are now written in response to Twitter spats. Moreover, links to cat videos, political advertisements, thoughtful essays, conspiracy theories, your cousin's wedding announcement, political commentary, and an Atlantic cover story can sit alongside one another on your social media feed. It's really difficult to know how to navigate this chaotic landscape prudently. And of course, it's even more of a challenge for the journalists who are striving to discern the lineaments of God's kingdom in the events of today and to consider how we might be called to participate in his ongoing work. Many contemporary journalists would attest to the challenges that our media ecosystem and its perverse incentives pose to producing good, redemptive stories. I'll endeavor to differentiate among some of these varieties of media, but it's also important to recognize the ways they're intertwined. Further, our posture toward the media often reveals underlying moral and social failures. Our failure to attend to what and whom we ought, our failure to recognize what actions are appropriate to our moment, and our failure to belong well to one another. A topic as seemingly discreet as the news ends up having far-reaching implications. But these profound implications mean we cannot ignore current events simply, simply because much that passes for the news today is trivial or vapid. Nor do journalists deserve the browbeating to which they are too often subjected. Instead, we would do well to apprentice ourselves to a long tradition, 
stretching from the Old Testament prophets to Jesus to the church fathers to many saintly contemplatives and social advocates that models a way of responding wisely to contemporary events. So in the, in the lectures that follow, I'll point to figures such as Henry David Thoreau, Blaise Pascal, Simone Weil, Thomas Merton, Dante, Frederick Douglass, and Dorothy Day as exemplars of this tradition. Their insights can teach us to be grateful for the good work of secular journalists who shed light on injustice. People like Art Cullen, a writer for the Storm Lake, Storm Lake Times in rural Iowa, who won the Pulitzer Prize in 2017 for his editorial, editorials that successfully challenged powerful corporate agricultural interests in Iowa. This tradition also teaches us to value Christian journalists and news organizations who strive to understand the affairs of our day by the light of the eternal word. World's Magazine Annual Hope Awards, for instance, highlight several nonprofits each year with the goal of honoring, quote, a few of the self-sacrificing Christian helpers in neighborhoods throughout the United States and profiling groups that have built replicable programs. Framing the importance of the news in terms of democracy may not offer sufficient guidance, although it's a fine place to begin. But as Christians, our citizenship in heaven and God's call to love our neighbor shape how we should attend to contemporary affairs. What do we need to know to love our neighbors well? Or, to frame the question differently, to what do we need to attend in order to live faithfully in this place and in this time? These are the questions that the gospel calls us to answer, and they're much more compelling and difficult than asking simply what we need to know to be informed voters. But to answer them, we need a practical theology of the news. While others have written perceptively regarding how Christian theology might guide news producers, Marvin Olasky's Reforming Journalism comes to mind, my aim is to think theologically about how Christians should consume the news. So in the, in the lectures that follow, I'll consider a Christian account of attention, time, and community, and how these three, three facets might shape our relationship to the news. Each of the, these three sections addresses a more particular question. To what should we attend? How should we imagine and experience time? And how should we belong to one another? Over the course of this lecture series, I'll respond to each question in two parts. The initial lecture will consider how our contemporary media ecosystem offers inadequate answers to these questions. And the second lecture proposes a theological answer and looks at examples of Christians who embodied this answer. Uh, and then it will identify specific practices by which we might cultivate a more healthy posture toward the news. Reading the news well requires a good theological understanding of the news, but that theology also needs to be instantiated in healthy habits. As authors such as Tish Harrison Warren and Justin Early have recently argued, regardless of what we say we believe, it's our daily habits that reveal and shape our actual theology. We're living through a time when technological, economic, and political forces are causing drastic upheavals in the news industry. And these changes are provoking an outpouring of essays and books about how to save journalism, what the news industry should look like in a digital age. But I want to take a step back and gain some theological and historical perspective on these more fundamental questions about the very purpose of news. If we have a better understanding of what the news is for and what it's not for, we'll be better able to produce wise reports and analysis of contemporary events and then to respond to these charitably. When the news sets itself up as the light of the world, it's usurping the role that rightly belongs only to the word proclaimed in the gospel. But when the news helps us attend together to the ongoing work of this word, it plays a vital role in enabling us to better love our neighbors.